meeting today. I would like to welcome you all from different parts of the world. Wherever you are today, I would like to greet you. Good morning, good afternoon, and maybe good evening. So today we are so privileged to have with us a very distinguished speaker in the person of Dr. N.R. Autistad, MD, if IPPCIPS. He is uh, past president of the WAPMU World Association of Pain Medicine United, and is a clinical prof associate professor. He is an associate division chief of acute pain medicine, a medical director, acute pain services, and the Stanford Comprehensive Interdisciplinary Pain Program Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine. I am so uh, happy and proud to present to you a very distinguished friend and speaker, Dr. Enner Autistad. But before we begin and we let him speak, I would like to ask everyone to pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for life. Thank you for your grace and your goodness and your guidance and for protection, especially in these uh, challenging times. We entrust Dr. Enner as he starts speaking and sharing to us his expertise on pain, on peripheral nerve stimulation that you guide him, give him wisdom and understanding. Can he be with each one of us today, wherever we are? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dr. Enner, it's an honor and a privilege to have you speak with us. Thank you for your time and your, uh, and your uh, generosity and sharing your expertise. It's now your turn. Uh, it's all yours now. Dr. Enner, all this time. All right, thank you uh, very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I have to say that may be the best pronunciation of my, of my name I've, I've had in a long time. So thank you for that. Uh, as mentioned, I am in, uh, at Stanford in California and it's around uh, 5 p.m. today. And we had a, a fairly uh, decent day without too much uh, smoke from uh, all the wildfires that are traveling around uh, this part of the country right now. Uh, I'll be talking about peripheral nerve stimulation here in my disclosures. The, the main pertinent one would be Binus, SPR, and NALU. Uh, and Nine Continents are all uh, companies related to uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. So just to start, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what chronic pain is uh, and how I look at it uh, at this point in time. So we, we all clearly know we have a time of injury. Uh, in, my, in my world, this is usually related to some sort of surgical type event. In the physiatry world, I believe it's gonna be much more related to some sort of discrete musculoskeletal injury. Uh, but this is the inflammation that starts the, the process. Uh, this leads to peripheral sensitization as these action potentials from the pathology travel to the spinal cord. And once they get to the spinal cord, we reach central sensitization. Uh, at this point, uh, we start running into problems and the patient may start going down the pathway uh, of complex regional pain, chronic disability, uh, and such, uh, unless we can abort it. So we have the pain, uh, we have changes to cognitive processes, we get associated emotional changes, cortical reorganization, and finally, uh, disability that we see with chronic pain patients. Uh, so what I really want to focus about is this step right here. Uh, what can we do to decrease that peripheral sensitization before uh, these malignant pathologic action potentials even hit the central nervous system? Uh, and I think of peripheral neuromodulation uh, as being distinctly different uh, mechanistically from uh, central uh, spinal cord stimulation. And this picture explains it in some ways a, a little bit. If I have pathology out here in the periphery, uh, I'm simply sending too much electricity up through the DRG through the dorsal horn. Uh, at that point, once I reach the dorsal horn, I'm already increasing central sensitization uh, as those excess neurotransmitters simply leach out from that specific uh, axonal pathway and starts affecting the pathways nearby it and we get spread of pain and uh, increased sensitivity. With spinal cord stimulation, we're putting the leads here. We're putting the leads higher than the pathology. Uh, so we are able to, in some ways, uh, uh, scramble that signal a bit. 
Uh, but more or less my experience with spinal cord stimulation has been that it tends to work for two or three years uh, and people uh, stop having as much uh, relief with it. If you then turn off the spinal cord stimulator, you'll see that the patient still has essentially that same unchanged peripheral uh, neuropathic uh, type of pain. However, uh, so I, I think the reason for this is, is that we still have this peripheral pain generator. Uh, all this malignant electricity is still hitting the spinal cord uh, and increasing that central sensitivity. Uh, where peripheral nerve stimulation fits in is that we are able to uh, affect this action potential, this neuronal pathway before the signal even reaches the DRG and that central spinal cord uh, to increase central sensitization. So this is what I've been doing for the last decade. Uh, I see a patient who has some sort of neuropathic pain injury, and this is easily 80% uh, of the patients I see at this point in time. Pretty much everyone has had some sort of surgery or some sort of trauma that led to persistent pain beyond the expected duration of healing. And generally when I see that, this expected pain is from an injured nerve and nerves simply take much, much, much longer to heal after they're injured, uh, frequently uh, on the order of years. So I would always approach these folks with this diagnostic test block first. Uh, basically that's good for one day of relief. Uh, I'll add the cortisone, sometimes that can give me a couple of weeks or uh, in some nerves, uh, specifically occipital nerve and maybe saphenous nerve for knee pain, I would frequently see folks get uh, maybe a couple of months um, of relief. But basically the nerve blocks were very temporary. Uh, steroids, Botox, intermittently beneficial, but generally I would go towards one of these modalities, some sort of ablation uh, or pulsing. So on the benign scale pulse radio frequency, and we're delivering energy uh, less than 42 degrees Celsius, uh, I stopped thinking of this as being a, a temporary or, or lesser ablation uh, several years ago. I now think of Pulse F as being a one-time peripheral nerve stimulation treatment. Uh, next, radio frequency ablation, actually heating up that electricity, uh, I'm sorry, heating up that needle with electricity to actually damage the nerves. Uh, this tends to work well in the spine, it tends to work well uh, for the small nerves around the joint if you have a large enough lesion. In the periphery, it hasn't worked that well. Uh, and I've uh, tried to ablate probably several dozen nerves without really having any uh, great success. And success would be actually clinical numbness in the distribution of that nerve along with pain relief. I would say I was much more likely to cause a neuritis when I apply too much heat to these peripheral nerves. Uh, next is cryoablation. Uh, cryoablation actually works uh, fairly well uh, for these peripheral neuropathic types uh, of pain. Cryo is able to kill that nerve uh, and provide numbness that will last for three months, four months, five months, that can uh, very closely replicate what happened with that diagnostic nerve lock. However, the downside with cryoablation uh, is once again, it lasts for three, four, five months. So this is something that uh, I generally would repeat multiple times a year. Uh, and after a couple of years of doing this, most patients were looking for uh, something different, but cryoablation uh, definitely can work. It still has the downside of, of neuritis, same as radio frequency ablation, uh, and my own personal rate was at least 10 to 15 uh, percent. And of course, we have uh, IV infusions. Now, if I think back about peripheral nerve stimulation during my own training, uh, 2008, as well as uh, PNS prior to that, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, they had a lot of problems. And essentially the problems are related to uh, the application of really spinal cord epidural leads in the periphery. Uh, so the problems are mostly related to uh, hardware migrations, uh, lead fractures and breakages, as well as issues with the IPG if you have an electrode and an arm or a leg and an IPG uh, in the torso. Uh, so overall, not terribly successful. My, my own attempts with this uh, were certainly complicated uh, by hardware uh, migrations uh, up to the skin and causing pain. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the concept of, of doing a diagnostic block. So the consensus uh, for the uh, neuromodulation appropriate uh, consensus committee is that diagnostic blocks are not required to see if uh, peripheral nerve stimulation will work. Uh, and I 100% agree with that. A nerve block is a sodium channel blocker. Uh, we're gonna turn off any action potentials traveling through that nerve. Per peripheral nerve stimulation is the opposite. We're adding electricity to the system. So doing a block and having it successful wouldn't necessarily predict that stimulation uh, is going to work. That stated, uh, I still do diagnostic nerve blocks the vast majority of the time because the diagnostic nerve block tells me that I'm uh, adding electricity to the correct neuronal 
pathway. Uh, so I want to talk about that a little bit using this slide. Uh, Richard North came to uh, Stanford, I think in October of 2019 or so, and we discussed peripheral nerve stimulation a little bit, and he pointed me to this paper he, he published uh, in the mid-90s, 1996. Uh, essentially what he did in this paper is he took patients with failed back surgery syndrome, uh, arachnitis type of uh, picture with uh, radicular lumbar pain. And he blocked it in multiple locations. So we see he blocked it at the nerve root. So this is what we would consider more or less an epidural injection at the sciatic nerve. Uh, this is nowhere near the spine. We're down uh, in the pelvis and the back of the thigh. At the facet, we're no longer blocking that spinal nerve. We're simply blocking the dorsal ramus of, this, uh, ramus of it. And then finally subcutaneous. And what he found is if you block that spinal nerve at the spine, you have 60, 70, uh, up to 90% reduction in pain. That makes sense. That's what we expect. But what was surprising to me is if you block it at the sciatic nerve, distal to the pathology, you still get pain relief. Uh, it's not quite as good. And now we see a decrease uh, down here 20 to 30, as opposed to the, the selected nerve down to basically 10% of the original pain. Uh, but it still blocks some of the signals. And then facet, uh, a little bit less successful. Uh, and finally, subcutaneous, uh, not clinically significant, uh, or more, more of a placebo type response. Uh, so this was kind of curious to me, and I struggled to explain why blocking a nerve distal to the lesion would work. Uh, and I classically think, and I'll demonstrate on myself here a little bit, if my arm is the nerve, and if I have pathology in the elbow, if I then go in and block the nerve up here, I should have numbness in the distribution of the nerve and analgesia. However, if I uh, block the nerve distal to the lesion here, I should have numbness in the hand and no pain relief. But the surprising results are you actually do get pain relief if you block distal to lesion. Uh, it may not be quite as much um, as 100%. As, uh, so the, the reason I think is, is simply this. If I can picture the nerve uh, as, a, as a neural container containing multiple fascicles, some of these fascicles traveling through that bundle are, are pathologic and are always sending uh, electricity. Uh, the rest are not pathologic. They're sending some electricity, not nearly as much as a pathologic one, but they're still sending some electricity. So my, my reasoning is if I go in and do a block distal to that nerve and I get analgesia, it's because I'm simply removing some of that electricity from the system. Uh, so even though I haven't blocked the main generator, I've blocked part of the nerve. So this is why I get a 60 or 70 or 80 percent uh, response. So because of that, I, I definitely like to do a nerve block where I somewhere in the path of where this pain is and have some sort of at least temporary analgesic response before moving to peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, and I also think by applying the stimulator out here in the periphery, uh, we are reducing that pathologic incoming C5 or nociception and in some ways replacing it with uh, more, more medical grade types of, of action potentials. Uh, so we can see reduction in central sensitization uh, over the course of time. Uh, I don't have any particular slides on that, but I, I will just mention in my, in my own experience, uh, generally what I see is when I implant someone, they use the device uh, for pretty much uh, 24 hours or 12 hours uh, in the beginning for the first few weeks. However, after, after a few weeks or a couple of months, they're able to reduce their use uh, to maybe six hours a day. And after one year, they may reduce their use to just one hour once or, or twice a day. And, and they get resi uh, residual analgesia after the stimulation um, stops. Uh, so first I wanna cover um, a recent review published in pain practice uh, by, I'm sorry, in pain medicine by uh, Tim Deere et al. Uh, so they more or less collated all the high level uh, randomized controlled trials uh, through history and presented them in one uh, nice paper. So we see the level of evidence for occipital nerve stim is, is level one. Uh, low back pain is also level one. We have level two for sphenopalatine ganglion stimulation, uh, as well as post-surgical shoulder pain. Uh, and this would be an axillary nerve type of stimulator. Uh, and finally, level two evidence for mononeuropathy of the trunk or extremities and level three for this is a tibial nerve, a percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, which is generally a treatment used for uh, bladder issues. All right, so the first paper uh, by Saper on occipital nerve stimulation, uh, all I have right here. So 75 patients, multi-site randomized trial. Uh, the caveat here is this is a paper using the epidural side of leads simply placed across where the occipital nerves uh, 
travel. They did show significant greater than 50% reduction in headache days or pain scores greater than three. Uh, and here we see adjustable stimulation and ancillary. Ancillary means that the patient had an occipital nerve block and didn't respond. Adjustable stimulation means they had an occipital nerve block and did respond. So basically both of these groups uh, did have uh, adjustable stimulation parameters. And we're seeing in terms of headache days, uh, baseline 22 down to 15 and 25 down to 16 uh, compared to the medically managed folks. Uh, so definite improvement on uh, with the, the headache symptoms with the stimulator, but really uh, problematic in terms of the adverse of, uh, events related to the, the hardware, as I mentioned earlier, has been my own experience as well. Uh, Sarah had a, another trial in 2012 looking at occipital nerve for migraine as well as medication overuse headache with crossover. Uh, the graph here is showing the median use of triptans over the course of time and we're seeing a significant reduce, uh, reduction in the amount of medications uh, as well as pain scores in, in this cohort. Once again, these are epidural uh, style of leads. Uh, in 2015, cephalgia uh, we have 157 patients randomized to 12 weeks active or control. Uh, and the results here, headache days, uh, similar to the last study, uh, down by uh, 6.7 uh, days with treatment. But once again, we have a complications of 183 uh, adverse events with almost 50% requiring surgery. And this would mostly be related to that lead migration or uh, fracture. Uh, here is uh, uh, Dr. McCall in pain practice with uh, 20 patients for 12 weeks. And uh, once again, headache is reduced quite well, uh, 8.5 days here. Uh, and we get to see 75% adverse event and 45% hardware uh, late related uh, one more time. In the table, we're seeing that the amount of uh, participants who achieved 30% pain reduction, 60% uh, in the active group and 30% in the uh, uh, I'm sorry, 60% in the active group, 20% in the control group. And 50% reduction in pain scores uh, was reached by 30% in the treatment group and 0% in the control group. Moving on to the sphenopalatine uh, stimulator. Uh, so a single uh, randomized trial, 28 patients um, using full stimulation, subperception or sham uh, stimulation. Uh, we're seeing 67% uh, relief in the stimulation group versus 7% in the, the sham group. Uh, this was a, a nice example showing that if you find that right nerve in the right pathway and you have a stimulator that's specifically designed for that, uh, it will tend to uh, work. Downside, of course, industry funded and 28 patients is, is not a huge sample size. Uh, the uh, post-surgical stroke pain uh, published by John Che uh, in 2014 he had 25 patients. They received three weeks of treatment with a single electrode uh, in the deltoid muscle uh, located to stimulate the axillary nerve versus uh, treatment was for six hours a day versus traditional treatment using physical therapy uh, as well as a sling. And in terms of the pain, pain, pain scores, we're seeing a more rapid reduction in the peripheral nerve stim uh, group. Uh, and this is maintained for uh, quite a long time. And, and we see not in this graph, but all the way up to three years in the paper. The tibial nerve stem for pelvic pain is a little bit of a different concept. Uh, this comes out of the urology literature more or less where patients with overactive bladder uh, or incontinence will go to the urologist's office and receive uh, almost an acupuncture needle or EMG needle um, placed uh, blindly or anatomically or, or possibly with ultrasound near their tibial nerve in the ankle and they have a 30 minute treatment and they do this once a week over the course of 12 weeks and this certainly seems to improve uh, there are bladder symptoms, both uh, subjectively as well as objectively, because we can ma measure this, uh, such as uh, void residuals, we can measure this with, with ultrasound. Uh, what was interesting is as the patients were being treated for their bladder symptoms, uh, they happened to have some pain relief. So several authors have now looked at chronic pelvic pain being treated with this peripheral stimulator uh, down at the ankle. Uh, so um, Balkan study, in the European Journal of Uro uh, Urology, 33 patients for 12 weeks. Uh, so this replicates that once a week type of treatment. 21% uh, had around 50% improvement um, in pain. Uh, so not really, really stunning results, uh, but certainly uh, there does seem to be a, a little bit of a trend that the tibial nerve uh, is in fact involved in pelvic pain. And then we have 
uh, the follow-up paper or, or this uh, second paper in, from 2012, Effects of Percutaneous Tibial Nerve Stem on Chronic Pelvic Pain. Here we uh, have another uh, small cohort of 24 patients and we can see our uh, pain scores before and after treatment, eight down to two versus uh, control. Uh, so uh, fairly decent uh, results for only 12 weeks of treatment. A sl slightly larger sham control comparative study uh, with Dr. Osden, 89 patients randomized for 12 weeks once again. Uh, and here we're seeing our pain scores hovering at around eight, reducing to around four uh, in the treatment group versus sham treatment not being uh, clinically significant. And I believe this is going to be the final one looking at percutaneous tibial stem for chronic pelvic pain. One more trial uh, with 33 patients. And here I'll point out the uh, PPI VAS. Uh, this will be the present pain intensity pain scores, uh, 8.4 reducing down to 4.5 in the treatment group versus 6.5 reducing to 5.9 in the uh, control group. Uh, the next topic will be peripheral feel stimulation for low back pain. Uh, so there's been three studies um, looking at this in the more remote past, uh, randomized control trials. Uh, Dr. McRoberts had 44 patients. Uh, that were entered, enrolled, 32 had trial implants and 23 uh, of the 24 responders went to a permanent implant. Uh, and the results were, were actually pretty decent, around 70% improvement uh, that remained for uh, an entire year. Dr. Van Gorp then looked at 24 patients, um, and 24 control patients and 28 treatment patients, looking at uh, adding one of these electrodes uh, to an, a patient who already has an indwelling spinal cord stimulator uh, for a failed back surgery syndrome. Uh, and when this was added to the SES, we saw uh, almost 43% uh, of patients had a greater than 50% improvement uh, in the treatment group versus uh, the control. And finally, Dr. Uh, Aldabe had a slightly larger study with 116 patients. Uh, once again, peripheral field stimulation for back pain uh, for failed back surgery syndrome, 33.9% uh, responders. Uh, in this paper. What these papers have in common is the electrode is placed directly in the area uh, of pain of allodynia in the low back uh, and it's essentially targeting these peripheral C fiber nerve endings uh, of whichever dorsal ramus uh, or spinal nerve has been injured and has persistent pain uh, from that previous uh, surgery. Doing so, uh, I think we're tickling uh, partially that axonal pathway that I talked about previously that's responsible for maintaining the pain. Uh, so I think that's why we're seeing partial results here uh, and not always great results because there's still significant uh, amount of uh, action potentials or, or fascicles that are not stimulated and are still sending the normal pain signals up to the spinal cord um, and brain. So this is an example of a permanent uh, peripheral nerve uh, stimulator. Uh, essentially what the systems have in common is they have uh, some electrodes with some sort of anchor on, on one end. Uh, so this is specifically designed to go in the periphery and, and stay in the periphery. And this tends not to migrate. It's also uh, nice and floppy and soft. So it tends not to, to break or erode through skin. Uh, on the other side of the, the lead, this is a, a 15 centimeters long. We have a receiver and this simply picks up the electrically generated uh, field from the external battery. So this external battery simply is placed right over where that electrode uh, sits under the skin. And as with all stimulators, we have, uh, have a remote. This device was approved using this paper from uh, 2015 by Tim Deere. Uh, so they um, had a multi-center randomized double blind partial crossover study with 147 patients. Uh, and uh, half the patients uh, or all the patients received the device and half uh, used it in the beginning and then there was a crossover. The overall response rate 38% versus 10% in the control group and overall reduction in pain scores 27.2 versus 2.3 in the control group uh, were actually not very good uh, in the paper but it was good enough to get approval from the uh, FDA in the United States. So the issues I had with uh, the paper actually uh, are simply related to the fact that uh, there were multiple implanters of a brand new device and no one really knew how to implant it quite well yet. So there was huge variability uh, in which nerves were targeted and how the nerves were targeted. And in my opinion, the most important thing was the lack of, of guidance. So these were basically placed using paresthesia uh, techniques. If the nerve were close to a piece of bone, uh, then fluoro would also be used. Uh, but otherwise it was 
mainly uh, uh, poking around looking for a paresthesia and then trying to place the leaf close to that paresthesia. The uh, newer papers and, and what corresponds uh, more to, to my personal experience is what we see here. So Dr. Chakravarti down in San Diego uh, put together uh, a multi-center uh, series on the use of PNS for the same indications as the pilot study. So here we have 39 patients uh, over 11 peripheral nerves from 18 centers, but the difference is, is now we have folks who have been trained uh, on placing the device uh, and these stimulators are being placed uh, almost uh, always with ultrasound guidance. Uh, so we can visualize where the target is and we can visualize putting the lead next to it. Uh, and with this, we're seeing significantly improved uh, results. So in general, I, I see 60, 70, 80% pain reduction uh, and 60, 70, 80% improvement in activity and usually 60, 70, 80% reduction in opioid use in my own practice uh, as well. Uh, the most successful nerve in this case was the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, 100% response. Uh, may be related to the fact that it's simply an easier nerve to find and secure the lead uh, to it, for example. But overall, and we see a variety of, of nerves in the leg, uh, over the torso, uh, as well as the upper extremity, uh, improving with uh, PNS. Uh, this is a uh, case series we did at uh, Stanford, Columbia, as well as Mount Sinai with some of my colleagues. Uh, so we had together 27 patients with lower extremity neuropathic pain uh, that responded to nerve locks. And these patients were all uh, candidates for dorsal root ganglion stimulation. Uh, we elected to try peripheral nerve stimulation first and our results were uh, fantastic. Our responder rate was 67% and the average pain reduction was 42%. I'm sorry, 62%, and most of these implants have been in for almost a year at this point in time. And we're seeing 94% of patients with an opioid uh, sparing uh, effect. The big point here is really no side effects when we compare that to DOG or spinal cord stimulation. Uh, so it certainly is, a, is an option uh, for the right patient before you have to uh, instrument the spine. Next, I wanna move, uh, move over from the mononeuropathy CRPS type of patient to a musculoskeletal pain uh, patient. Uh, so I would say the evidence so far presented, except for maybe the low back, uh, has probably been mostly related to a persistent neuropathic pain from trauma to the nerve uh, via surgery uh, or, or some sort of uh, accident. Uh, in those cases, peripheral neuromodulation or central neuromodulation uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, that neuroma, that angry nerve, is always sending some sort of electricity off to the spine, uh, hence the chronic pain. And that electricity is then always uh, sensitizing the spine uh, as well, causing the problem to be more persistent and more ongoing. Uh, this makes sense for neuropathic pain, and that nerve is always going to be angry. Uh, however, it doesn't make sense for musculoskeletal pain. Uh, and I'll show you at the end of this talk some papers on acute pain uh, where the peripheral nerve stimulator systems uh, have been uh, mostly partially uh, successful. Uh, however, there are certain candidates where it has been very successful. And in my own practice, this started off with suprascapular nerve stimulators for people uh, who really needed to have shoulder replacements. Uh, so bone on bone in the shoulder, my first patient was someone who was wheelchair bound with congenital abnormalities, uh, and he simply uh, didn't want to have their replacements because he would be immobile for probably six to 12 months after surgery. Uh, so I thought that was that was kind of a reasonable candidate to, to do this uh, shot in the dark to see if I could control uh, someone who had never had surgery to his shoulder but had constant pain with PNS. And it turned out it worked uh, fantastic and I replicated that in, in more papers, uh, more patients since then. Uh, what I think about philosophically is when that joint pain is uh, extremely severe and it's chronic and it's there all the time, uh, then it functionally becomes a neuroma. It becomes the same as CRPS. At that point, we always have these action potentials going from the shoulder to the spinal cord and we enter the same type of pathology as we do with CRPS. And I think that's why for the more severe joint pains, uh, I've started to have success treating that with PNS. But also why the more young joint pains, the joint pains where uh, it's still really limited to mechanical pain or weight-bearing pain, uh, those guys have not been great candidates for PNS. So uh, the uh, initial poster uh, I, I put out on uh, this, I think this may have been in 2018, uh, I looked at saphenous catheters placed uh, for 
uh, knee pain and axillary uh, catheters placed for shoulder pain in patients who were not uh, post-op. And it turns out we actually had the same 60% pain reduction in that population as we had in our peripheral nerve pain population. Dr. Desai in New Jersey uh, then followed up with his own series of eight patients having axillary nerve stimulators for this pre-op shoulder pain. Uh, and he had 80% responder rate. Implants have been in for almost two years and we're seeing this closer to 70% pain reduction uh, that I mentioned multiple times, uh, as well as a pretty significant reduction uh, in opioids in his population. And now one of the things I, I like to point out on this slide as well is that we're doing these axillary nerve um, stimulators uh, essentially in this location here. Uh, so in some ways, the fibers go into the shoulder that are carrying the pain signal are coming from here. And we're blocking that nerve, getting a positive response and stimulating that nerve distal to the lesion, right? The pain is coming from here. We're blocking and stimulating distal to where we think the pain generator, rate generator is. And we're still seeing uh, impressive uh, results. Uh, Next, this will be a different type of uh, nerve stimulator. Uh, this is only a, a case report, but I do want to mention it, uh, showing that the specific type of peripheral nerve stimulator doesn't necessarily uh, make that much of a difference as long as you get some electricity on the correct nerve. Uh, the patient with the right pathology will generally feel better. Uh, and this was an elderly gentleman, 94 years old, with intractable shoulder pain. Uh, not really able to move it much. He responded excellent to a 5cc block with uh, lidocaine with resolution of pain. And that led to an implantation of this uh, a quad electrode in that suprascapular uh, notch. Uh, so his pain under movement reduced down to zero. Uh, and he had a program with 10 hours of stimulation per day. And that was sufficient to provide a 24 hour pain control. Uh, and this was sustained up to six months. Uh, this slide is simply a technical report. Uh, I've talked about uh, shoulder pain being amenable to suprascapular and axillary blocks. Uh, uh, knees will be amenable to both saphenous nerve approaches as well as genicular nerve approaches. Uh, I just want to make a note that the hip, even though the nerves are, are deep, can still be accessed uh, and treated with peripheral nerve stimulation. The uh, femoral articular branches uh, I've always thought of as being relatively straightforward for that. The obturated uh, articular branches would certainly be trickier, uh, but here we see a combined ultrasound guidance as well as fluoroscopic guidance approach uh, will let you get that lead down to target for good pain relief. Uh, this is a, a third type of stimulator. And this is actually a temporary stimulator, but this was placed for a distinct musculoskeletal pain. Uh, a little bit different from the joint pains I, I mentioned earlier, but I consider the pathology to be very similar. Uh, so 10 years of trochanteric bursitis, uh, when that pain has gone from being intermittent related only to walking uh, to being constant pain uh, at that lateral hip, the patient becomes a candidate for stimulation. Uh, and my, my personal practice has been to target the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and I've had reasonable results with that. Uh, Dr. Guran specifically targeted the superior gluteal nerve, which does make sense. Uh, that is what innervates our gluteus medius and tendon going to the greater trochanter. Uh, and uh, she had excellent uh, results. This stimulator was placed for two months uh, right near that gluteal nerve uh, over the, the ileum, and the patient had resolution of pain. Uh, even six months after removal of that uh, stimulator. Uh, so that goes along with, with my philosophy of that peripheral, peripherally generated electricity hitting the spinal cord uh, in some ways can reprogram it away from uh, whatever is going on in the periphery where that neuroma is taking that patient down the path towards CRPS. Uh, if we can apply the electricity to the rec correct nerve in that system, uh, the hope is that we can abort that patient from going down the path uh, and getting a re extremely refractory uh, central pain syndrome. In general, the earlier uh, I intervene in a patient, the more success I have with stimulation. Uh, by that, I mean if a patient had, has had a, a post-surgical neuropathic pain for, say, six months, uh, sometimes I can get away with simply doing a block and steroids or maybe one treatment of pulse radio frequency. Once that patient has had pain for maybe six months to a year or 18 months, then generally I find that the one-time treatments aren't sufficient and I'll generally have to move on to at least a two-month uh, temporary treatment with PNS. And then for the folks who've had chronic nerve pain for, for 10 years or 20 years, I will generally go straight to, to a permanent system 
and because they're they're going to need a, a bit more time to to reprogram um, their CNS. Uh, this is a uh, case series looking at the, another wireless peripheral nerve stimulation uh, system. I just want to point out uh, nine of these patients had specifically painful joint pathology, and we can see a stem to the junicular nerves here, a, a suprascapular nerve here, although it looks like it's came a little bit out of the fossa, a clunial nerve here over our uh, iliac crest, as well as the articular branches of the femoral and obturator nerve. Uh, and as mentioned on my previous slide, we can probably even find some, some better approaches to, to get into those nerves. Uh, but the point remains, if we're, if we're able to get an electrode on that nerve, uh, the patients tend to do uh, fairly well. Uh, eight of the nine patients had over 50% uh, pain relief, and of those eight patients, five were able to reduce uh, their opioids by an average of uh, 66%. Uh, so after, I think that'll, that's, that's most of the, the evidence that's come out specifically for musculoskeletal pain. Uh, we had the low back papers and we have uh, mostly case series and case reports as discussed. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about peripheral nerve stimulation distal to, to lesion as a concept. Uh, so we have a few patients where we've taken that idea uh, all the way to implant. Uh, my friend, Dr. Hurdle uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville had this uh, elderly gentleman with failed back surgery syndrome. Uh, the MRI showed clumping of the nerves and a, and a stenosed foramen, and the EMG confirmed L5-S1 radiculopathy. However, the, the pain pattern was really radiating down to the top of, uh, I believe it was the right lower extremity. Uh, so Dr. Hurdle uh, took his ultrasound machine and he looked at that nerve. Uh, I frequently get these types of consults and I look at the nerve on ultrasound and I see that the nerve is swollen or the nerve has a neuroma and then I can kind of diagnose this is why the patient hurts. But in this case, Dr. Hurdle took the ultrasound, he looked at the nerve and he found the nerve to be completely normal. It could not explain why it hurts. Uh, and then he blocked it with uh, two milliliters of a quarter percent papivacaine and the patient had re uh, almost resolution in pain uh, for two days. Uh, so and, uh, significant enough to move to uh, peripheral nerve a stimulation system. So he used the permanent type of stimulator uh, and we were able to see the pain went from an eight down to a, a, a one and he was able to walk five times further. And these are results that have uh, persisted up until uh, this point in time. But once again, it's, it's only a case report. And Dr. Gofeld in uh, Ontario, uh, he had a similar case. In this case, we are looking at the failed cervical uh, surgery type of syndrome. Uh, so he presented as a C6 the radicular pain pattern uh, and ended up with a C6 spinal nerve stimulator. Uh, so once again, the pathology is in the nerves in here. The electricity is being applied distal to lesion. Uh, and the patient had 50% pain reduction. Uh, I'm sorry, he had 50% paresthesia coverage with the electrode and had 40 to 50% uh, pain relief uh, with that. Uh, once again, stimulation is being applied distal to lesion. Uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Gulati at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I recently published uh, this this year. Uh, it's a case series of eight patients who had peripheral nerve stimulation for uh, cancer pain. And uh, if I do a, a little bit of an analysis of his results, uh, this allows me to add a few more cases uh, to stimulation distal to lesion. Uh, so we have specifically three patients where we have cervical and lumbar radiculopathy with the pathology being at the level of the spine and they responded to a suprascapular, brachial plexus, and sciatic nerve temporary uh, stimulator. So these were all placed in the periphery um, with, uh, with uh, very good results. Our suprascapular nerve, pain went from an eight to a one during stimulation. And then after the two month of treatment, the pain only went up to a two. And that has been maintained for 18 months at the time of publication. The uh, brachial plexus catheter pain went from an eight to a two. It was also maintained uh, until the cancer spread outside of the distribution of the coverage. Uh, and that was the same with the sciatic nerve. Once the disease progressed, uh, the pain relief from the stimulator uh, wasn't quite as good. And, and uh, of course, this makes, this makes sense. Uh, there's no reason why the PNS should, should help for pain that's not being carried by that uh, nerve system. This is an example of a temporary nerve stimulator. Uh, in this case, we're seeing a, a single uh, coiled electrode with a little bit of a hook at the end. Uh, so this is placed through a needle after, after stimulation and then this needle is simply removed and the hook remains in the, the muscle tissue 
close to the nerve. And this is percutaneous, it's temporary. So this is, system is simply placed under a, a sterile tegaderm. Uh, and after the two months, we uh, remove everything uh, intact. The uh, key paper uh, for this system uh, came from uh, Chris Gilmore back in, I believe, 2018 here. Uh, so he, this is a follow-up study to uh, uh, a trial from Richard Rock. Now in this follow-up study, they enrolled 28 patients for post-amputation uh, pain uh, with the treatment for four weeks. And they essentially had a femoral as well as a sciatic nerve uh, stimulator. And the efficacy endpoint was greater than 50% pain reduction uh, during the uh, treatment. And here we see our graph, the simulation is turned on, uh, our pain is reduced from a six point something down to a one point something, and then the leads are pulled at month two. And what we see is that the analgesia obtained during treatment is simply maintained uh, for a full year. So we're seeing 80% average reduction in 12 months uh, in the responding uh, patients uh, for phantom limb pain. Now moving on using the same type of approach, uh, Dr. Caporal decided to put one of these electrodes in the multifidus in 2018. Uh, and this is simply a, an autoplane technique showing the needle trajectory. This would be where our erector spinae muscle are. The more medial aspect is the multifidus. Uh, and the stimulator is simply targeting this uh, dorsal ramus uh, kind of near, near the, the facet joint uh, in this location. And what he found is uh, in both patients, he treated for one month, then he pulled the electrodes out the pain relief obtained during treatment was uh, maintained up to four uh, months. So naturally this led to a follow-up study by uh, Dr. Gilmore, uh, where we uh, took 12 patients and were, were brought in, nine were, were implanted, uh, and they were taken up to a, a year. The average duration of pain in this population was actually 10 years. It was considered uh, non-specific pain, and this was a non-surgical population with no uh, radicular pain. Uh, the treatment, uh, was six hours per day uh, in that muscle. Uh, and the results we see mirror uh, the same results of the case report. We're seeing the pain go down from a six to a one during treatment, uh, but then it's more or less maintained uh, for a year after the leads are pulled. We're seeing 63% average reduction amongst responders here, a little bit lower than the 80% we saw uh, in the pilot study. And possibly that could be related, uh, according to my theory, due to the duration uh, of pain, where I feel like the longer someone has had duration of pain, the, the more stimulation they, they may tend to need uh, to reverse that. This is a second follow-up study for uh, the same system, looking uh, at temporary stimulation for low back pain. However, uh, in this uh, study, they were specifically targeting opioid uh, reduction. Here we have 11 patients, but otherwise it's the same system and the same type of factors. We're seeing 64% uh, of patients having greater than 50% reduction in pain. 82% uh, had 10 point reduction in our ODI and 82% had a 30% reduction in pain interference. Uh, so simply another, another um, same paper uh, trying to convince us that for that axial low back pain, peripheral nerve stimulation to the multifidus uh, can be very, very useful, uh, even though we only treat it temporarily. I uh, mentioned in the beginning, uh, I would talk a little bit about acute pain studies. Uh, so I'll, I'll present a series of three here. Uh, Brian Ilfeld in San Diego is responsible for, I think around 18 or 19 papers uh, looking at various surgical populations with temporary electrodes. For this paper in 2018, he was primarily looking at unilateral TKA patients uh, and the leads were placed seven days pre-op and kept for six weeks. Now, the uh, takeaway here, uh, number one, is that the patients did really well. Uh, six of seven patients were extremely well controlled with less than four on the numerical rating scale for that entire two week post-op period. But we do have to keep in mind, they also had an adductor canal block, uh, which was ran, uh, I'm sorry, which was started and ran continuously at 20 hours uh, post-op. So my, my takeaway here is that the peripheral nerve stimulation was, was helpful uh, but it was not complete. The patient still needed to use those typical perioperative uh, techniques for, for pain control. In, in, my, in my own mind, I, I think this is interesting uh, as we do a significant amount of TKAs every year, 
uh, I think it'll, it'll reach uh, 3 million here pretty soon. And 10% of these patients in general are, are, are unhappy with their post-surgical experience. And sometimes that's mechanical, uh, but at least uh, in my world, it's, it's a relatively high incidence of neuropathic pain. Uh, usually pain in that infrapatellar saphenous nerve or, or sometimes one of the genicular nerves. Uh, so these patients are, are simply uh, fantastic candidates for peripheral nerve stimulation uh, after the fact. What's interesting to me is, is here is the concept that if you take a normal patient and you stimulate, you don't necessarily uh, find mind-blowing results. But the question for me is if you try to do this for someone who came in uh, from a place of complex regional pain syndrome pre-existing, or from a place of being a high dose opioid user, it makes a lot of sense to me to place a stimulator maybe a few weeks pre-op, use it to help control that pain ahead of the surgery, reduce the opioids ahead of the surgery. And then if we do the surgery in that setting, we may see some more pronounced post-op clinical differences in the two populations. Uh, here we are looking at ambulatory foot surgery. The concepts are the, the similar uh, small cohort, seven patients. Uh, they had the PNS placed within seven days of surgery again. In this case, three of seven patients had to use that popliteal catheter. Uh, they would push their, their uh, bolus button for, for over three days. Uh, and overall, their pain scores decreased 52% after 30 minutes of applying the, the stimulator. This is, a, this is a, another point of the study we see here is the graph is as the acutely turned on stimulation in the PACU, over the course of five minutes, the patients were able to realize some analgesia. Uh, if they used sham stimulation, we can see the pain scores actually uh, came up uh, a little bit. And then in the sham group, they had no response until they had real stimulation, then their pain scores started to drop as well. Uh, this has not been, uh, been repeated uh, in a follow-up study, I think looking at, uh, at uh, knee, knee pain and they tried to do the same thing and did not see that immediate analgesic result. Uh, next, here is a study looking at post-op shoulder pain. What's interesting here is the initial attempt was suprascapular nerve PNS, which I would have thought to be a fantastic idea, uh, but they did not have any sort of result. And then they switched to a brachial plexus approach, placing the electrode in the middle scalene. Uh, at this point, we still have that same small effect in PACU with more than half of patients needing IV medications or interscaling block. But overall, the patients did fairly well with fairly low pain scores and a low amount of opioid use over the course of time, but maybe not quite sufficient to control that uh, most acute pain. Um, there's a series of, of, of papers uh, looking at carpal tunnel releases and ulnar tunnel releases. Uh, Tessa Gordon is one of the uh, uh, most uh, pronounced publishers in the, the area. The uh, takeaway concepts for me, and by the way, this is the most recent study in that, in that, in that series. The takeaway concept uh, overall is if you, do, if you have an injured nerve, uh, median nerve or ulnar nerve, and you do a decompressive surgery, if you do a one-time peripheral nerve stimulation treatment, so this, in this case, one hour at 20 hertz uh, in the recovery room, uh, the surgeon simply places the lead near the nerve and then they close the wound around it. Uh, the patient gets the treatment in recovery, then the lead is pulled. So that's the only time point. It's a 30 minute, very finite treatment in PACU. Uh, but what they found uh, in the other studies and then repeated in this one is actually clinical proof that the nerve regenerated better. Uh, we have a higher level of motor unit recruitment and we have an improved grip strength and key pinch strength uh, up to uh, three years later. And once again, this is a single 30 minute uh, treatment. Uh, and this is, this is only one of, of multiple papers showing that effect. So the, the concept here is if you have a nerve injury, it does make sense to treat that nerve injury with uh, electrical stimulation for analgesia. Uh, I think we've shown that. Uh, I think it makes sense to stimulate that nerve to improve that patient's physical function, to get them more active, to get them into physical therapy, as well as reduce their opioids. Uh, but I'm not quite ready to say that peripheral nerve stimulation is, is going to be beneficial, uh, the way we do it for pain, is going to be beneficial for uh, specifically nerve regeneration. Uh, I think we still have to do that, that research, uh, but definitely the, the possibility is there. Now, how do I think about this? Why would this work? Um, if I think about phantom limb pain or even CRPS, where we have central neural plasticity, uh, we have reorganization uh, uh, in, our, in our brain of uh, where the pain is coming from. Uh, we use things like mirror box therapy. We do desensitization treatment uh, with our physical therapist. Uh, 
that is basically just retraining the nervous system to be less excited about this particular uh, stimulus. Uh, and by doing so repeatedly over the course of time, by touching that painful area over the course of time, we're desensitizing, we're teaching the brain to ignore that stimulus. In some ways, I feel like the peripheral nerve stimulator placed on the nerve basically accelerates that process. Uh, when we're directly activating those action potentials, we don't necessarily have to do that act of physical rubbing uh, because action potentials are already traveling up uh, towards that central uh, nervous system uh, and doing what they need to do to effect uh, the same change that in the past we did by doing physical therapy and rubbing with a feather uh, for six months. Um, also, the other, other part of that, uh, what was pertinent to my, to my slide, is I, I think, think of the, king, the same concept should be true uh, for motor nerve regeneration as, as well. So for the same reason, I think we can reduce pain uh, centrally uh, using elect electricity, the same concept should work for improving strength. If we're passing electricity down that motor nerve, that pathway should simply get stronger and better and more efficient, uh, and grip strength, grip strength should improve uh, as a result. This is a, a case report of an amputee uh, below the knee amputation, uh, traumatic with residual limb pain. So he developed a common perineal neuroma at the fibular head that led to a decompressive uh, surgery. The neuroma was, uh, was decompressed and the nerve was buried down in uh, the calf. He did great for about six months, then the same pain uh, rec recurred. He saw a surgeon again, the surgeon did another surgery. This time, instead of just decompressing, they transected and they buried the residual nerve uh, on the uh, uh, anterior aspect of the tibia. The patient did great for another six to nine months, then the pain returned, and this was my first experience with him. Uh, when I looked at his common perineal, perineal nerve with ultrasound, I, I could essentially see where a new neuroma had formed that was positive with some light pressure uh, with my, my ultrasound probe. Uh, so faced with this, we could of course do another surgery, but most likely he would simply develop another neuroma and he would need uh, another surgery in six more months. So uh, he was sent to me for consideration of a peripheral nerve stimulation. Uh, here we're seeing a mark of where he wears his prosthesis. So I have to make sure I, I implant the electrode uh, above that so he can wear his prosthesis. I find the sciatic nerve. And here we're seeing the sciatic nerve over here. This is the tibial component. This is the common perineal uh, component. We're seeing our, our musculature uh, here. And then there's a small blood vessels that travels uh, directly uh, under it. Uh, now this view, I have placed a spinal needle close to the nerve. So we're seeing a little bit of the shadow and then out of plain view here. So I'm stopping short with this sharp implement, uh, but I'm immediately uh, above the nerve. And then I can go in and test stimulation with a nerve stimulator probe. And we can see how now I'm going all the way down and touching the nerve with that. This is a sciatic nerve in plane. We're seeing a little bit of that blood vessel uh, below here. And then I, I confirm I'm on that common uh, perineal aspect of the sciatic nerve. Uh, I'll then deploy the lead through an introducer. Uh, and here the introducer is a bit bigger than my stimulation probe, so we see a, a larger shadow uh, out of plane going all the way down to the lateral part of the sciatic nerve, which I confirmed was the common perineal uh, component. Uh, and here we can see the electrode actually being deployed. There's a little bit of the electrode coming out right here in this in-plane view. And here we can see the, the electrode in short axis view uh, sitting right on top of that nerve. And finally, uh, after I place the uh, electrode, I have to, uh, I have a remaining three or four or five centimeters of that antenna sticking out through skin. So this is just showing how I, I, I can bury that electrode using this introducer, just simply place it in there and then split the sheath apart to bury uh, the electrode. Uh, so the final scan here, we're seeing the electrode scan down to where it's laying on top of this common perineal nerve. And this is uh, access scan of the antenna as it's remaining in the subcutaneous uh, tissues just in this fat layer uh, above the muscles. And then the final move is I mark out where the electrode is, I mark out where I buried that antenna, and simply this is where that electrode will go uh, to turn the stimulator on uh, for the patient. So I, I showed you my nerve interventions for pain uh, before I started applying peripheral nerve stimulation to my practice, uh, and this is my current uh, most common approach for nerve interventions. Um, I have much more uh, durable 
persistent good results with PNS. So I haven't really seen the, the reason to go down uh, this pathway over here uh, as much anymore. Now, I, I still will, will do some of these, especially I, I still like to do pulsed radio frequency uh, for the folks who have younger uh, neuropathic pain. The people that I'm catching maybe six months after their surgery, I'll generally like to try to do maybe one of those before moving to uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. So my new treatment algorithm here, I start off with that diagnostic block. I just wanna get the diagnosis established. Uh, I want to turn off that pain, yeah, even if it's CRPS, I want to turn off that pain momentarily uh, with a block to confirm I'm on the right pathway. And then I'll move to peripheral nerve stimulation as the next step. Uh, if that doesn't work, then I'll generally do peripheral nerve surgery with good diagnostic workup. We're, we're having great success uh, with, with our colleagues in neurosurgery at Stanford. And after that is when I'm now going to my ablative strategies. These were the strategies where I had to repeatedly uh, do this type of uh, procedure every three, six, or, or nine months on the patient. Uh, and then finally, our, our spinal cord stimulator and intrathecal medications uh, still remain uh, on this right-hand side of the treatment algorithm. Uh, but I'll say maybe two years ago, PNS was, was right over here. Uh, and as I've seen more and more success and very few side effects, uh, it's, uh, it's moved over to that left side of the uh, algorithm. So my conclusion, uh, peripheral nerve stimulation has, has definitely proven effective. We have level one evidence very clear for occipital neuralgia. Uh, I do think the epidural leads were very successful in treating occipital neuralgia because we're able to capture a majority of the nerve uh, as long as the, the lead goes across where the nerve is in the back of the, the occiput. Uh, the downside is simply the hardware wasn't designed well for it. Uh, we know that it works well for low back pain. Uh, the subcutaneous leads work okay, I think because they're only getting partially uh, the, the field needed. Uh, and then the newer evidence for uh, the more specific peripheral nerve stimulator for the low back also seems to work fairly well, as long as we're activating the right part of the multifidus. Uh, and then most of the evidence is still going to be for CRPS and post-amputation pain. Uh, I spoke a little bit about perioperative main pain management where I think uh, the PNS can be helpful uh, but it's not quite ready for prime time where I, I by any means would recommend everyone has a peripheral nerve stimulator placed um, before their perioperative, uh, for their perioperative uh, pain control. Uh, however, that stated, uh, I do think you have the right candidate for it. Those folks who are at high risk of developing a flagrant CRPS uh, after their surgery, you know, or those folks who have uh, pre-existing high dose opioids, where you may want to use a PNS device to taper them before they have surgery. Uh, I think for those folks, PNS does make sense. And this is where uh, I'll, I'll place it myself maybe a couple of times uh, a year. Uh, will PNS be equally effective for musculoskeletal pain? Um, I, I think we're, we're seeing more and more that it's helping, uh, but I also think I have a better understanding for why it sometimes does not work. Uh, so I, I, would, I would suggest make sure you do that diagnostic block uh, if it's knee pain, don't assume it's a saphenous nerve. Don't assume it's all four genicular nerves. Uh, for that uh, knee pain, uh, my approach uh, is to do a little bit more of a specific uh, clinical uh, exam and history and try to figure out which nerve it is. Uh, for example, if I touch that anterior knee and they have allodynia, I'm immediately thinking for saphenous nerve, uh, infrapatellar branch, especially if they have pain as a tap over that distribution. And if they have no cutaneous changes, but they still have constant uh, dull ache or burning pain inside their, their knee, uh, then I'm thinking genicular nerve. So just like you can get a peripheral nerve injury to a cutaneous nerve, you can also get that to one of the internal nerves. Uh, in that situation, I don't go in and block all four nerves. Uh, I'll block the one that I think is the culprit and wait five minutes and try to narrow it down. And it's usually that, that the inferomedial or superomedial nerve that's uh, involved. In those cases, PNS makes a great sense uh, as well. And finally, PNS distal to lesion, uh, we're, we're more or less toying uh, with that as a concept. Uh, but I would say if you have a patient with severe neuropathic pain that you consider PNS for, uh, and you can't necessarily block that nerve in the lumbar plexus or sacral plexus, uh, try a block in the leg or the arm. And if they have pain relief, I would still consider that patient uh, a candidate. It looks like uh, Jamie is uh, coming on here. So I think that's uh, my time here at 59 minutes and 32 seconds. Wow, that's a very excellent lecture, Dr. Enner. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few questions for you, if okay with you. Yes. Is that all right? Okay. Uh, my first question is, uh, of course, from our perspective, there's a lot of us here who are 
physiatrists and uh, some are also, we have a radiologist uh, right now. And of course, uh, we also have uh, anesthesiologist. Uh, we have some options that we usually do like, uh, of course, for CRPS, uh, it's a difficult uh, subject that uh, most of the time we think of peripheral nerve stimulation as, uh, as really a, a better option. But for, for neuropathic pain, for example, we think always of uh, peripheral nerve hydrodissection, ultrasound guided. And my question is, <clears throat> when, do you, when do you think about uh, including peripheral nerve stimulation as, uh, as a better option for, for pain caused by, well, of course, nerve injury, neuropathic pain, or sometimes post-amputation? Uh, so when, when will this come in as a, as a better option for treatment? Yeah, so it really goes to the, the cause of the pain. And that diagnostic mm -hmm. workup is going to be the most important piece. Uh, so based on the history, I try to figure out what is the culprit nerve uh, if uh, they've had some sort of, of, of uh, multiple surgeries. And then I look at that nerve. I'm going to look to see if it has abnormalities. Uh, if I find abnormalities, they tend to be one of two types, a constrictive or the nerve is edematous and swollen. Uh, and sometimes both, because the nerve will frequently be swollen after an area of constriction. Uh, hydrodissection, nerve blocks, cortisone, uh, are great to inject around that nerve in the area of constriction. Uh, and certainly you may be able to get some persistent results. Uh, I, I think that's a genius first step to do. And that's more or less what I do with my first step, which is that diagnostic ultrasound, to look at the nerve uh, as well as do uh, an injection. I generally don't specifically hydro dissect with, with uh, saline. Uh, I'll typically just go in and hydro dissect that with uh, lidocaine and then cover that same area with a, a little bit of cortisone. Uh, then at that point, I'll have a conversation with my peripheral nerve surgeon if I'm seeing abnormalities in the nerve. Uh, so if the nerve is, for example, caught up in surgical scar, uh, that's something that they may have to consider doing a revision for. If the nerve has areas of ongoing entrapment, uh, then generally they're not going to be great candidates for PNS. However, if what I'm seeing is simply swollen nerve with no areas of direct uh, damage, uh, then generally doing more surgery to free it up isn't going to be uh, extremely helpful. Uh, and doing a hydrodissection simply around a neuroma isn't going to be hugely uh, helpful in the long term. So in those cases, I would lean towards doing the peripheral nerve stimulator a little bit sooner um, I can recall a uh, recent case of a, uh, an extreme VIP that came into my clinic at Stanford with, uh, I think, 10 days of neuralgia parasthetica, or pain radiating to his hip. Uh, so very, very early on in this course, most patients wouldn't make it to our clinic for at least a couple of months, but being a VIP, uh, everything was more or less fast-tracked. Uh, so I, I saw him in clinic, I looked at his nerve, and he had an enormous lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, traveling through his inguinal ligament uh, with a positive tenels. Uh, he responded beautifully to a nerve block with a little cortisone, uh, but had no persistent analgesia. Uh, so two days after the nerve lock, uh, they were already asking me to, to do a, a, a stimulator. Uh, so I think probably by, by week three or four, uh, we uh, implanted him with a, a nerve stimulator on the, the nerve. And the nerve stimulator worked great for a certain component of his pain. Uh, it took away his cutaneous allodynia and sensitivity and superficial pain, and he was able to wear pants again. So he was partially happy, uh, but he still had this deep, dull ache that uh, went away with the block, but was still present with the stimulator. Uh, so he actually repeated the block on top of my electrode. That remaining deep ache uh, went, uh, went away once again. Uh, so I sent him for a decompression. And actually did the decompression with the surgeon and I placed the lead on the nerve before closing up so he could use it for post-op pain as well. And that actually worked great. Uh, so my, my learning from that uh, case was that if the nerve is still actively entrapped, the peripheral nerve stimulator alone is not going to be sufficient. If there's ongoing uh, ischemia, now of course in this case, the pain had already been around for a month, so it was very young pain. Uh, but if there's ongoing uh, ischemia or, or neuronal damage happening because of entrapment, you really need to, to do that surgical decompression at the same time uh, as the peripheral nerve stimulation. And then, uh, as you know, the surgical decompression may take six to nine months before you see uh, benefits as the nerve needs to, to heal and regrow. So the nerve stimulator uh, can be used for analgesia during that uh, time period. 
Is this the same uh, uh, time duration for permanent uh, implant? When you say six to nine months, uh, is this like a temporary only or how is it different if you say it's a permanent implant? So I, I choose which device I implant in the patient based on, sometimes based on how long they've had the pain. Now I, I always talk about the pros and cons of each system. As you saw in the, uh, the, the literature, in the evidence, even patients with 10 years of chronic pain have shown response to only two months of treatment. Uh, so it certainly is reasonable to try that if the patient really wants a permanent system. Uh, so some of the key reasons for that is, number one, the patient simply doesn't want something permanent in their body, then using a temporary system is, is really your only um, option. Number two would be medical. So some people may need to get uh, routine MRIs. And in that case, you won't be able to do an MRI while that, uh, that uh, nerve stimulator is indwelling. So you would have to pull it uh, and then get the MRI and then possibly reinsert it uh, down, the, uh, down the road. The uh, permanent ones, uh, basically I'll, I'll, I'll steer the patients towards the permanent ones if their pain has been one or two years old, and I may steer them towards the temporary one if their pain has been six months to 12 months. But the truth is uh, no one has ever really insisted on having a permanent device if the temporary device uh, may work. So that's probably not uh, really much of an issue. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, very, very great. Now, one more observation is that uh, with low back pain, for example, uh, we, we see that uh, when, an, when an, a nerve root is impaired, or even if the disc is the one that's compressing the nerve root, for example, we notice that uh, there is a response of the spinal cord to increase the sensitization of the dorsal root ganglion, and that, in, and that causes some kind of a re on the on the lumbar spine. Now, what would be the best timing uh, for patients with low back pain to put on peripheral nerve stimulation um, short of doing surgical intervention, for example? My, uh, my low back pain population is a, is a little bit different from, from what you see in the studies. I've mostly been implanting folks who already have had one or two or three uh, spinal cord surgeries. Um, the, uh, the, the reason for that is, is number one, I, I usually don't get the, the virgin back patients. Uh, just just being a tertiary care center, we, we tend to get the consoles a little bit uh, later. But secondly, I think it's a little bit more interesting to me if I think about failed back surgery as being chronic neuropathic pain in the back. I think if I can find that right dorsal room, uh, dorsal ramus that's involved in, in maintaining that pain, uh, PNS should work uh, really well. So I'm stating all that because my, my own personal results haven't been quite as good as the published results. Uh, I'm seeing more, more that uh, only 50% of my patients for low back are having persistent relief uh, after two months. And most of my patients are moving on to something uh, permanent uh, in terms of that. So I don't have great experience in, in uh, doing that for more or less the, the virgin uh, low back and uh, only uh, having to do it once. I, I mostly been placing it in patients who've had low back pain for, for a long time. Uh, and as you can imagine, they've been a little bit more recalcitrant to, to getting that persistent relief. I see. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Sari. Dr. Sari, would you like to uh, revelate your question? Hello, Dr. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to know how about uh, cycles degree for PNS and is cooling RF is required for PNS? Thank you. I didn't quite catch it. Is something required for PNS? He didn't catch what the full question was. Okay, Dr. Sari, can you repeat your question? <clears throat> oh, I see, she wrote it down. Hold on, excellent presentation. Uh, how about cycles, degrees for PNS? Is cooling RF required for PNS? Yeah, perfect. So uh, pulse radio frequency. I, I actually am a, a huge fan of uh, pulsed RF as a concept. And from probably 2011 to 2017, I, I pulsed uh, thousands of nerves, uh, including pulsing the supraorbital nerve inside the, under the orbital rim over the, over the eyeball. Uh, pretty much you can pulse, pulse any nerve anywhere in the body and, and not much bad can happen. Uh, the only downside with pulsing is that it doesn't always work. It only works uh, about half the time. So what I traditionally tell patients and what I learned to tell patients back in 2011 is around 50% of patients will get 50% better 
uh, with normal pulsing settings. And now, as I explained, I think that the reason for that is if people who've had more long-term chronic pain simply won't respond to that single pulsing type of treatment. Now, the settings I, I use uh, with my, my new understanding of pulsed RF as really being a temporary PNS uh, has been to be as aggressive as I can be. Uh, the basic settings on, on, on the machine will be 45 volts with a 20 millisecond pulse width uh, running at two hertz uh, with 42 degrees temperature limitation. Uh, what I'll generally do is I'll turn up that temperature limitation to 50 degrees uh, and then I'll turn the voltage up to 65 or 75 and then I'll uh, start the cycle. If I don't see the temperature uh, rise, uh, at least to, to, to the lower mid 40s, uh, then I'll stop the machine and maybe even increase the voltage to, uh, to 100. Uh, I'm simply gonna, gonna try to apply as much electricity as I, as I can to that nerve uh, without actually having it heat up too much. Uh, I'll, I've even had to change the frequency from two hertz to, to five hertz if I really want the temperature uh, to go up uh, a little bit. And that's mostly gonna be if, if I'm doing a, a cutaneous nerve. Now, so I'm sure if you try to pulse a nerve near the skin, the temperature may not even go from 34 degrees Celsius to 38 degrees Celsius. So in cases like that, that allows me to apply more electricity to the nerve without truly heating it uh, so I can go to uh, 100 volts. Uh, let's see, cycles, degrees. Uh, in terms of duration, I'll typically tr uh, treat the nerve for four minutes. Then I'll adjust my needle, maybe move it to the other side of the nerve uh, and treat it for four more minutes. Uh, I've done personal tests where on the same patients, uh, I did two minutes of uh, PRF or four minutes of PRF, eight minutes of PRF and 60 minutes of PRF. Uh, and I didn't see a big increase in duration going from eight to 16, but I did see an increase in duration going from two to four uh, at four to eight. So I generally uh, will pulse for uh, eight to 12 minutes uh, on the patient. And uh, is cooling RF required? Uh, not, not required. Uh, in the U.S., pulse radio frequency is, is actually not approved by most insurers. Uh, so ever since 2017, it's been hard for me to do. Uh, but for those folks with that younger pain, uh, I'll still at least try to, to maybe get that through insurance uh, since I, I don't necessarily think those folks will have to move to a uh, stimulator. And the other question was, do I think the duration of PRF makes a big difference? I think I, I answer that uh, as well. Uh, in my practice, eight to 12 minutes has become the, the sweet spot uh, per nerve. Thank you so much. Okay, there's another question from uh, Pash. Pash, go ahead. Pash. Morning. Good morning, doctor. Thank you Hello. very much for giving us this lecture. It's very helpful. I mean, it's something new for me. This is the first time I've heard about it. My question is, um, whenever the patients are on temporary uh, stimulation, ENS stimulation, um, when do you actually decide that, okay, uh, the nerve is already uh, doing better and we can discontinue it? Do you have any parameters to decide about this? Do you do some tests first or is it like a trial and error? Like, okay, so we can discontinue this for a short period of time then take it out altogether. Thank you. Yes. So great question. The uh, temporary trial simply goes in for 60 days. You don't really have to think much about it uh, beyond that. Uh, once you do the diagnostic nerve block or hydro dissection or EMG uh, or pulse radio frequency uh, or whatever procedure you're doing first uh, to see if this is the correct nerve, then you order the temporary PNS and you just plan to put it in and you plan to leave it there for the entire 60 days. At the end of the 60 days, you pull the electrode out and then you simply have to wait for a week or so to see if the, uh, the pain will be maintained uh, or uh, if you have to move on to a permanent stimulator. And I more or less uh, tell patients based on what their presenting pain is, what I think the likelihood will be of moving on to a perm. Basically that, that younger pain uh, and, and kind of a psychologically healthier patient, I, I tell them you're gonna have a pretty good chance of having a resolution with one treatment. Uh, that older pain or a more psychologically complex patient with multiple chronic pain issues, uh, I'm gonna tell them probably they're gonna need to move to that, that permanent uh, stimulator. There is an intermediate step here that I haven't mentioned yet. And that is some patients, uh, you actually re-implant that temporary nerve stimulator once or twice a year, uh, because sometimes you don't get the 12 months of benefit, but you may get six months of benefit after two months of treatment. Uh, and in those cases, uh, I, I kind of consider it the same as a radio frequency uh, type of approach, uh, where you have to treat 
that that nervous system uh, twice a year uh, and, and to rely on the residual uh, benefit. Uh, I should I should make a point that the nerve stimulators are, are made by different companies. So uh, just because a patient responds to that temporary nerve stimulator, that company doesn't have any sort of permanent stimulator. Uh, so that means programming parameters change, the system changes, the electricity will somewhat change. Uh, so there could be a, a discrete reason why someone specifically only likes the temporary one. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Enner. That was a very, very in-depth, e excellent uh, presentation and uh, thank you really for your time and uh, for your generosity to uh, share your expertise with us. And we really appreciate uh, your time with us today. And uh, I hope you're safe wherever you are in, uh, in Stanford. I know there's some fire there, but uh, it has already been controlled and uh, I really appreciate you for all your contribution today. Oh, my, my pleasure. There was one final question from Colin Chong. Uh, what do I think of pulsed RFA followed by continuous uh, RFA? When I'm doing uh, treatments in the level of the spine, I actually do that sometimes. You can turn those pulsing settings so aggressive that you actually get a full thermal lesion. Uh, so in those cases, I may change the voltage to 100 and change the frequency to 5 hertz and set my limiting temperature to 80. Uh, in that case, you will get the pulsing beat and the associated electrical field and uh, whatever effects and that will have on the system. Uh, and that'll be happening for the first one or two minutes until the temperature goes up to 80 and then you'll start uh, ablating. So you actually can kind of do both treatments at once. All right, thank you all. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Enner. Uh, Dr. Enner, uh, I, have, I have some uh, requests for you. I, I'll just have to uh talk to you privately later <laughs> if that is fine with you that's good okay so thank you very much and uh god bless All take right. care take care everyone <laughs>